90.3 WHPC now presents Law You Should Know. The law affects every aspect of our lives, our home, our jobs, and our recreational activities. Now, learn about the law and how to protect yourself against the loss of your liberty or property and learn how to stand up for your rights and seek compensation when you have been wronged. Your host for Law You Should Know is attorney Kenneth J. Landau, a past dean of the Nassau Academy of Law and frequently lectures to lawyers on ethics and avoiding problems with clients and to the public on how to choose and use lawyers. This is Law You Should Know on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Hi, this is Ken Landau, and welcome to Law You Should Know. Our special guest today is attorney James Harrington, who's a partner in the law firm of Hoffman & Barron. They're a boutique law firm concentrating in the area of intellectual property, and that means protecting your ideas. If you come up with an invention, if you write an article, if you have a unique product, you design jewelry, or anything along those lines, it's very important you protect your ideas and also don't infringe on someone else's intellectual property. And Jim is a, a graduate. He is of Adelphi with a master's in biology. And many intellectual property attorneys, as you'll find out, have advanced degrees in the sciences. And he also has his Juris Doctorate degree from Hofstra Law School. Jim, welcome to Law You Should Know. Glad to be here. And we're going to present it, information that you or a friend or maybe a business owner can use and, and use in your personal life as, as well. What attracted this field of law to you, Jim, to get involved in the uh, protecting people's ideas? Well, it's funny. I, it really started from, from the science. I was a biology major in undergraduate school and thought about medicine, thought about research, uh, neither one of which you know, really, really grabbed me. And so um, I was in a, a seminar course, and there was a student in there that was heading to law school uh, to do patent law um, and explained that that was a good way to sort of use the, um, his scientific background um, but not necessarily, you know, be too hands-on, and it just seems like a good mix of science, law, and business, and I've uh, I've enjoyed it. Just describe to us the the main areas of intellectual property law, the the type of work that your firm does. Yeah, generally, when we use the term intellectual property, what what we're talking about is the value that's inherent in new ideas, artistic expressions, uh, the goodwill or the reputation of a business. And so, you know, people want to protect, protect those. And so generally, you know, we're talking about um, patents for, for new ideas, uh, trademarks for the, the goodwill or the reputation of a business, uh, copyrights for artistic expressions, and, and trade secrets if you have information that could give you a business, business advantage and, and other competitors don't know about it. And this includes a book or article you write, includes music you may create. That's why you sometimes hear artists claiming another... You know, someone else stole their music or parts of their music? Correct. Yeah, those would typically go under the copyright category for artistic expressions, um, music, uh, articles, um, would would fall under copyright. And I think you meant to mention a trade secret, so famous recipes, the formula for pudding or cookies or some other invention, some chemical, some perhaps a drug, all comes under trade secrets? Yes. Trade secrets is really any information that could give you an advantage uh, if your competitor doesn't know about it. Um, So that could be, um, like you said, a a recipe. Uh, The most famous trade secret is probably the Coca-Cola secret that's, uh, from what I understand, still in the vault somewhere in, in Atlanta. Um, it could be a customer list, um, you know, that, that gives you an advantage. You wouldn't want that to get, get into the hands of your competitor. So those types of things, try to keep them a secret so that, you know, your, your competitor, you know, you, you have an advantage over your competitor. And if people, if someone invents something, they want to protect their idea. If they do it as part of the business, they want to make sure the business can protect their idea. And if you're an employee of a company, you want to clarify whether it's your own invention that you have the right to license or, or patent, et cetera, so you're not involved in litigation later on. Yeah. Patents typically protect new ideas or new designs. Um and so, yeah, the, the ownership is an important issue. Very often, uh, there are employment agreements in place that, um, you know, clarify that when an em- employee, employee uh, comes up with a new invention, you know, 
uh, during during business hours using the company's resources that that any of those inventions would belong to the company. It can be when you're leaving a company, there may be prohibitions against taking secrets with you or other ideas or intellectual property of the business. What kind of what are some things that employees and employers have to be careful of to protect their rights? Yeah, well, when it comes to patents, it, it's important to have those inventions assigned over to the company so that um, it's it's clear, even though it, w- it should be you know cl- clearly set forth in the employment agreement, you still want to have that assignment um, agreement in place, clearly um, transferring the rights from the, the so-called inventor, the individual who came up with the idea, to the company. So that, that would be done in an assignment document that we record with the patent office. Something like trade secrets, it's very important to um, nail down an agreement ahead of time before they leave that they will not be disclosing any of that, any of that material uh, because that, that's one of the disadvantages of, of trade secrets is once they're hard to hard to protect, especially in, in this day of uh, the information age and information's flying around all over the place. Once that information gets out, it's really hard to, you can't get it back. And your re- only recourse is really against that individual. And if you're on the other side, if you're a worker who's come up with some idea or invented something, perhaps you did it at midnight in your basement and it wasn't done as part of your responsibilities or on company time, you might want to s- you know, speak to a lawyer about protecting it and perhaps licensing or selling it to your employer, but retaining control. Yeah, you could do that. Um, you know, it again, it depends on the um, you know what it is you're actually doing. If if what you're doing sort of on your own time clearly has nothing to do with your 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 nine to five business um, responsibilities. You, I think you've got a, a pretty good argument that it, it really it really belongs to you. If you're um, still operating in, in the same field, it, it could get a little bit um, you know a little bit more difficult. And so it probably would be good to have a discussion with the employer just to make sure that there aren't going to be any issues down the road. And again, perhaps see speak to a lawyer to protect your rights. Yes, yeah. you know before you discuss it with the employer, just see what the different issues could be down the road. Mm-hmm. And in terms of let's say a patent, people see it discussed on Shark Tank all the time. What makes it a better mousetrap? How is it something that where the idea can be protected, the manufacturing can be protected, and not legally copied? Yeah, I mean, there's there's three basic requirements for let's say an idea to to be patentable. Uh, number first, it needs to um, satisfy the the patentable subject matter requirement. It can't just be a product of nature. It can't just be an idea, an algorithm. Um, it it you know it needs to be something tangible and and useful. Um, and like a mousetrap. Yeah, like a physical mousetrap, right? Would be would be uh, would be a classic example. Um, it needs to be something new. Um, it can't be something that's already out there, um, and it can't really be obvious in view of something that's out there, right? Very often, you know that that's the um, the trap that that inventors run into. They they make a small improvement, and then the patent examiner will come back and say, "Well, you know, if you look at if you look at this reference and you look at what what else was out there, it would have been obvious to sort of this fictional person of ordinary skill in the art to sort of put those elements together. So it can't be a better mouse trap. It has to be a different type of mouse trap. Yeah, it, it needs to be it needs to be better in something that wouldn't have been obvious to someone you know who operates in that field. But if if it's not, let's say, the snapping <laughs> mouse trap, if it was a maze or something else, that would be something totally different. Yeah, yeah. Again, depending on what was out there, as long as it hadn't been disclosed before, and it, it really does, you know, make a meaningful difference, then yeah, that, that could be patented. What are some other issues that come up with, with patents, either protecting them or challenging them? Yeah, I, I think, well, the third requirement, you know, when we file these patents is, in, you know, in addition to it being, you know, um, novel and satisfying the patentable subject matter requirement, um, it needs to be described in a, in a way uh, to allow someone else, you know, in the field to be able to make and use that invention, right? Because a patent really is sort of a social agreement, right, between the government 
and society. So, you know, the government is saying in return for you fully disclosing your idea, we will give you sort of a, a, a certain term, 20 years, to exclude others from um, from from doing, you know, that that idea. And so it's it's sort of an agreement. But, you know, the, the, the part of the agreement is fully disclosing in, in, a, in a clear way what it is exactly that you're you're claiming. And so that might be through a careful diagram, careful wording of the process of, of manufacturing it and its purpose and what it does? Yeah, very often you'll see patents um, will have drawings that are associated with them, um, especially for mechanical inventions. We'll have um, the uh, drawings that identify the different elements. They're very often numbered. And then it's all also verbally described as well. And then at the end of the patent, you'll see what, what are called claims. And it's those claims, again, outlined in, in a verbal format, that specifically identify what it is, sort of the property or the turf or the fence that you're building around that idea in order to sort of keep people out. And, and that's, that's another, I think, um, sort of misunderstanding about patents that some people have. It's really not a right to do anything. A patent is a, only a right to exclude others from doing something. And so it's like winning the race and and specifying description of the race, what ra race you have won. Yeah, it is a race in in terms of the the U.S. is now has joined the other other companies or, or countries around the world into uh, to move to a first to file. Okay, and we're going to come back that first to file and what it what it means. I just want to remind our listeners we're talking to James Harrington, and he's a partner in the the law firm of Hoffman and Barron, and they're an intellectual property law firm. They help people protect their ideas, including patents. And he also handles uh, intellectual property, including trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets. We'll explore all those areas and what people have to do to protect their ideas and avoid infringing on them and what the limits might be. Um, so j let's go back to that point. And you're listening t to this program on Law You Should Know here on 90.3 WHPC, the voice of Nassau Community Co College. So let's go back to that point about what they have to do to be, why it's important to be the first to file. Yeah, years ago, um, the U.S. Uh, was one of the few countries that um, had a first-to-invent system. And that, that became very complicated because then we would sometimes get involved in these what, uh, proceedings called interferences to try to figure out who was the first one to invent. And it became, um, you know, very, very complicated. You're going through notebook records and emails and whatnot. So what do you have to do to protect your ideas? So you invented something in your basement – but you haven't sold it, you're, you're still tinkering with it. What do you have to do to protect your idea before someone else does? Well, now that we move to a first to file, the, the most important thing is to get that application on file before you disclose it to anyone, S certainly before you disclose it to anyone without a non-disclosure agreement in place. And so um, that's really, you know, the best thing to do. And, and that might include your employer, especially if it's something, something you tinkered with or you're trying to sell it to people. And you want to make sure they don't steal your ideas. You want to have that non-disclosure agreement. Yeah, before you disclose it to anyone, you, you know, really what what's best, if possible, is to have at least what they call a provisional application on file. A provisional application is a patent application that um, does not it does not require all the formal requirements that a, a non-provisional application would would require. But it holds your place and gives and helps you establish that you were first. Exactly. As long as that provisional application describes the invention, uh, so that again, you know, someone would really understand what it is you're talking about. Um, do you need a rough diagram? Do you, do you need to do that patent check to make sure no one's beat you to the punch? That helps, yes. Um, what we do, you know, very often, like you said, people come up with new ideas all the time, and they'll think, well, I haven't seen it on the store shelf. It must be new. Um, but they'd be very surprised if they go on to the, on, onto the patent office website. You can do your own search. It's a, it's a fairly user-friendly website. It's at USPTO.gov, USPTO for standing for the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. It's a USPTO.gov. You could do your own search, plug in your terms, 
you know, that relate to the invention you're thinking about and see what's there. There's all sorts of things there that never see the light of day. But those people have, prote- uh, s- someone have protection in case they ever bring that product to market. Yeah, I mean, with those disclosures out there, right, that would prevent, you know, someone else from, you know, from patenting that idea. So it can be a rough diagram. The important thing is to, exp- like a proof of concept, explain what it does, why it's different, and why it goes to places where no one has been before. Yeah, you know, the general standard is that it needs to be described in such a way that someone in that field uh, could make and use the invention. Um, that, you know, so if you, if you can do that, whether it's by words or by pictures or typically both, that's, that's the, the, the standard you need to satisfy. And that's why in programs like Shark Tank, the sharks ask people uh, if it's protected, and many times the response is patent pending. Yes, yeah. Um, and what? So they they've done what you said. Hopefully, they hired a patent lawyer like yourself. As the patent office is processing that idea, what are they going to be looking for, and how long will that process take till they actually have a patent? Yeah, it, unfortunately, the 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 process can take take a while. Um, it could take a couple of years from from beginning to end. Um, by the time uh, you you sit down uh, with with a patent attorney. Um, work with him or her to get that patent application on file. It'll probably, you know, sit in the queue at the patent office for at least six months, sometimes, you know, a year before it's it's examined. And what happens at that point is the patent examiner in the patent office will do uh, a search um, to see whether there's anything else out there that either, you know, fully discloses that, that invention or, like I said, at least makes it obvious Uh, to someone in that field. And if so, they'll write up, you know, uh, a report. They call it an office action. They'll um, identify the references that they feel are are relevant. Um, And then at that point, we can either try to amend the claims to avoid, you know, what's being cited against us or and or we, we can make arguments to explain to the patent examiner why those references really don't disclose what it is we're claiming. So you want to show how your product is different and something totally new, Mm -hmm. not just improved. Yeah, and again, it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't have to be just a product, right? It it could be, um, in general, the the inventions take two different forms, either um, a a composition or something physical, a machine, a machine, um, or it could be we also uh, can claim methods or pro- processes. So it could be um, a, a process of, of manufacturing something along those lines where we just outline the steps that are performed in, in that method. So what would be a way of having a new method or process for doing something? What's an example of that um, that might, you might be able to protect yeah, if you if you wanted to let's say come up with a um, a, a new formulation, you could uh, either claim the the formulation itself, right? Either you know a, a formulation for doing you know doing something that has elements A, B, and C in it, and you know that that formulation you know didn't have those elements previously. You could claim claim the formulation or the composition. And then, you know, very often in the same patent, we, we could claim a method of manufacturing that composition, right? So it, it could be, um, you know, uh, a, mixing A with, with B at a certain temperature, um, you know, mixing it for a certain amount of time, heating it, drying it, you know, different, different types of um, so steps. So the, to- the outcome may be the same. It may be a similar product, but it's a whole different method for creating it. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, I a mean, better way to make ice cream, a better way to make paint. Right. So again, that's a good example. You're not you're not um, necessarily claiming ice cream, but you could if you did come up with a new a new way of, of making ice cream that is you know has a improved mouthfeel texture. Um, you know, what you, if you, you use different that. proportions of ingredients or mixed it a little differently? The ice cream. Yeah, you know, again, it you 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 could uh, if if it has elements in it that um, you know that w- were not in there before and wouldn't be uh, taught or suggested by anyone else, 
that's something that you could try to pursue. So the idea of adding stuff into the ice cream, putting it in, in the middle or different sizes? That probably wouldn't be a patentable. You know, that's something that, you know, may be protected in other ways. That may be where, let's say, a trademark might come in, into play, where people would associate some catchy name with the ice cream that has, you know, whatever in the middle of it. Um, and you could protect it that way. So the important thing is that people should do the research to see if some if someone has done a little research or you do it on the behalf, do you submit that to the patent office to show them you've already, to help speed up their process or you're better off not doing that because you'll just create problems for yourself? No, actually in the U.S. Um, there's a requirement actually where you're required to submit to the patent office any um, references or what they call prior art uh, that, that may be relevant. So when we file that patent application, we're also required to um, either at that time or soon thereafter file what's called an information disclosure statement that provides all that information that you're aware of. And that kind of gives the examiner a little bit of a head start. And that strengthens your patent, right? Because if a competitor tried to use any of those references to say that your, your, your patent is, is not new in light of uh, what was out there, um, you know that they that would be a hard argument for them to make if the examiner's already considered it. Okay, just want to remind the listeners we're talking with James Harrington. He's a senior partner at Hoffman and Barron. They're an intellectual property law firm, also covering you know patents, trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets. We've discovered some of those, and we'll be talk continue to talk about the other fields. And you're listening to Law You Should Know here on 90.3 WHPC. If you missed any part of this show and you want to tell someone else about it or listen to it again, just go to the website for the podcast at nccradio.org. If they do all these things, are they protected in the United States? And does that extend to other countries? Or let's say no one has filed it, has, used, has taken the steps you mentioned in the United States, but they have in Great Britain or in Asia. Does that affect their right to patent it in the United States at all? Yeah, patents are geographical, right? So each, if you want protection in each country, you need to um, file a patent application in each country. There are some regional areas. The European Patent Office is, is the you know the classic example where you can file in the European Patent Office, and once that patent is granted, you can then elect to uh, validate. They call it in in the various countries. It's you know the the more countries you validate, you know, the, the, the more expensive it is, but you then have protection in those countries. But in general, uh, if, if you want protection in Israel or, you know, uh, other countries, uh, Australia, Canada, Mexico, you need to go into each country and, and file that application. And if you, if you as a, a patent attorney find someone who has a, a patentable idea, but they may then have the money or the know-how to bring it to market, you can help to connect them with resources who might be able to do that and protect their ideas or have them you know, give a license or something along that line? Yeah, that, that's a very good point because very often, you know, we're, we're involved so early in the process. Like I said, you really want to, if you can, get that patent application on file before you disclose that idea to anybody. At that point, you know, the, very often the, the, the business development part of it hasn't even, hasn't started yet. So getting the patent is, is just the first step actually creating the business around that that new idea is is another whole process and yeah we we don't really do the business development ourselves but you know we we know plenty of people that can help with that with that aspect of the business can you tell us the website for your office where people can learn more about uh, <coughs> patents and trademarks and copyrights and trade secrets and the work that you do with them yes our website is www.hb IPlaw.com. Okay. And what are some other things that people should be aware of when it comes to patents? We'll, we'll discuss, you know, the other forms of intellectual property on another show, but in terms of patents, any other thoughts? Yeah, I think one thing to stress, I think, is the patents don't really permit you to do anything. Many, many times people feel like, well, I have this patent, or I came up with this new idea, um, I, I, can, I can just do it, right? But that's not necessarily the case because a patent only allows you to exclude others from, from, from your idea. The, the classic example is, is the chair, the, the rocking chair example, right? Where I uh, come up with invention for a chair, right? It has four legs, a back, a seat, 
Uh, then someone else comes along and comes up with the idea for a rocking chair, right? So they have the same elements, but they figured if I put two bowed pieces of wood at the bottom of, of the four legs, I can rock back and forth. So a person could actually get a patent on the rocking chair by adding those new uh, the new elements of, of the curved pieces of wood at the bottom. But they wouldn't be able to practice that invention without a license from the person that has the in patent for the chair, right? Because the rocking chair includes all of those elements. So, the, you know, that's a, an example where the person could exclude others from making rocking chairs, but in order to build their chair, they need a license from the first person. So that's just an example. Of, and that would be true if they wanted a, a, a rocking chair that can be extended up or down mm -hmm. or expanded side to side. Right. Right. So what's the moral of that story, that you've got to realize what's out there, you've got to have something totally new? Yes, yeah. I mean, you know, very often people are, are focused on trying to prevent others from, you know, from practicing their idea. Um, but at the same time, they need to sort of keep in mind that um, there could be other people out there with, with similar ideas and they don't want to step on their territory. So if they have that idea on how to prove the product, improve the product, make more uses from it. Can you help them to protect their ideas and maybe negotiate with the rocking chair maker to open this new world up to them? Yeah, that's that's also part of what we do is we um, we uh, help people enter into licenses when necessary. Um, you know, very often those licenses come up in the context of a litigation. Um, if you were sued, very often a license is one way to sort of resolve that dispute. But, you know, we like to try to, you know, avoid those, the, the litigation. Um, you know, it's very expensive. And so, you know, the a voluntary license would be one way of handling that. And on the flip side, if, if you have a, you know, patent or some kind of intellectual property protection, if you see someone infringing on that, you have to say something. You can't just let it pass, and, and maybe a lawyer letter or something, but you have to speak out to, to at least set up a record that you're letting them know they're infringing on the packet. Yes, yeah, and that, that, that brings up another point, because when we talk about you know patents or trademarks, you know we kind of divide it into, we being patent attorneys, divide it into what we call prosecution, which is sort of a getting or obtaining the intellectual property, and... Um, and litigation, which is in the enforcement or protecting someone for who's been sued. Well, find the limits of that protection if you are the inventor of something else. I would like to thank our guest, James Harrington of the firm of Hoffman and Barron, and their website is hbiplaw.com. For being our guest on Law You Should Know and sharing this valuable information with us in the Patent Office's USPTO.gov. Please join us next week at this same time for another program of Law You Should Know, and also listen to the podcast and tell others about the podcast of this and many other law shows at nccradio.org, and you're listening to 90.3 WHPC. 